So welcome back to the playlist on gene expression. So just to do a quick review of what we've been talking about in the past few videos, we're talking basically about the central, central dogma of molecular biology and biochemistry. And so essentially what we start off with is we start off with DNA that's inside the nucleus. And through a process referred to as transcription, so this is number one is labeled as the process of transcription. We basically go from a DNA template and we synthesize all kinds of RNA. And there are several types of RNA that we're concerned with. Number one, we have messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is the transient carrier of genetic information from the nucleus into the cytosol where the ribosomes are. We also have two other very important types of RNA, which are referred to as transfer RNA or tRNA. We also have ribosomal RNA or rRNA. And there's another one that's of a little bit of importance when you're talking about um, splicing of RNA, and that's referred to as small nuclear RNA. But in general, we're concerned mainly about the first three here, mRNA, tRNA, and ribosomal RNA. And then what we can do is once we get the RNA out into the cytosol where the ribosomes are, we can do a second process referred to as translation. And translation is essentially catalyzed by a large uh, multi-enzyme complex referred to as the ribosome. And actually the catalytic part of the ribosome is the ribosomal RNA. And when we do the process of the ribosome, we do many, many catalytic cycles of it, we essentially get a protein. And that's the final product of what we're concerned with. So we're going from DNA, which is the permanent storage of genetic information in the cell, to RNA, and there's various kinds of that. And then we use those various types of RNA to make a protein. And that process occurs through the ribosome. Okay. However, it's not as simple as this. Um, we have several processes that we have to do um, in between these uh, transcription and translation processes. For example, in one of the previous videos, we looked at different types of RNA processing. We saw that when you process mRNA, you have to do things like making a 5 prime 7 methyl guanosine cap. You have to splice out introns and glue the exons together. And you also have to uh, use an endonuclease to cleave off specific sequences at the three prime end, and then use polyadenylate polymerase to make a poly A tail on the three prime end. And then there's also some tRNA processing to make funny bases and things like that. And then um, there's very little processing that goes on with ribosomal RNA. Okay, but the point is that you have all these processes that go on. Well, you can make all sorts of funny bases with tRNA, but there's actually another process that we looked at in the previous video for tRNA processing. And it's not so much a processing that we're doing, it's more of an activation, okay? So what we're essentially going to do is we're gonna do something called charge. We're gonna do something called charge the tRNA, okay? And what do we mean when we say a tRNA is charged? Well, when we say a tRNA is charged, it means we have the tRNA molecule, and then ligated to it, we have some amino acid, and different tRNAs are specific for different amino acids. So when you have this complex, a covalent bond between the amino acid and the tRNA, we say, number one, the tRNA is charged, and we say the amino acid is activated. And only when we get this complex in this form where the amino acid is bound to the tRNA, only in that form is the ribosome able to deal with the amino acid. So that means there has to be some intermediate enzymatic process to charge the tRNA. And that was the topic of the last video. And we just looked at it from more of a physiological perspective. But in this video, we're going to look at it more from the biochemical and organic point of view. And the enzyme that catalyzes the ligation of an amino acid to a specific tRNA, this is the reaction of aminoacyl tRNA synthetase. Now, the first thing that I do want to mention is um, the origin of the name synthetase. 
So whenever you have a synthetase, that sort of gives you a clue as to what one of the substrates of the reaction might be. And whenever you have a synthetase, in general, most of these enzymes operate through a substrate known as adenosine triphosphate. There's a few of them out there, like one in the Krebs cycle, that use um, that make GTP or use GTP. But in general, we're talking about enzymes that use ATP. Okay, and certainly amino acyl tRNA synthetase is one of those. Okay. And the origin of the, name, of the name synthetase is that whenever you have a ligation reaction that requires adenosine triphosphate, um, that particular enzyme is called a synthetase. Okay, So what this enzyme is going to do, as we'll see in a few minutes, is it's going to use the energy from adenosine triphosphate to ligate the amino acid to the specific tRNA. And actually... All synthetases fall into a class of enzymes known as ligases. And if you're looking at this according to the EC nomenclature for enzymes, this is what we refer to as a class 6 enzyme. All synthetases are ligases, and ligases are the class 6 of enzymes according to the uh, typical nomenclature. Okay. The next thing that I want to mention is in this particular reaction where we're charging the tRNA, what are the rate-limiting nutrients for this biosynthetic reaction? Well, we've sort of already mentioned one of them. One of the, the rate-limiting nutrients is adenosine triphosphate. Okay, And let's kind of very quickly ponder where we might get that nutrient from. Well, um, that's generally something that we achieve through consuming food. So we have this idea that you know, you get some, let's say you eat a potato. Well, you eat the, the, the things from the potato. You can eat the skin, you can eat the inside, whatever. Um, most of it in the potato is basically either fat, in the case of sweet potatoes, and you'll have some carbohydrates in there. But in any case, those get broken down into things that go into the TCA cycle, right? So fat can get broken down into acetyl-CoA. The glucose from the potato can end up going into glycolysis, forming pyruvate at the end. Pyruvate reacts with the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex to give you acetyl-CoA, and that goes into the TCA cycle. Ultimately, the TCA cycle will give you NAD and ubiquinol, and those nutrients power proton pumping by the respiratory chain in the mitochondria, and then the power of proton pumping fuels ATP synthase for the production of ATP. So ultimately, this ATP generally is going to come from the diet. If you're not getting a lot from the diet, you'll do things like gluconeogenesis, ketone body synthesis. Ultimately, that will lead to ATP synthesis, but significantly less than you would get if you're eating things from the diet. So fasting is not really good for protein synthesis. If you're going to if you want to facilitate protein synthesis, you certainly have to be producing a lot of ATP because what we're going to find is that per reaction of amino acyl tRNA synthetase, you'd use one ATP. Okay? And over the course of a lot of protein uh, syntheses, that's a lot of ATP that gets used. Okay? The other rate limiting nutrient that we have are the actual amino acids. Okay? So these are the two direct um, these are the direct rate-limiting nutrients. And, of course, you could consider tRNA, but we're not going to consider that here. So the other rate-limiting nutrient is the amino acid. And there are 20 primary amino acids that end up in proteins with the um, obvious excep exceptions of selenocysteine and selenomethionine. Those are actually, um, one of those is selenocysteine is a post um, it, it's a post-ligation modification of serine, actually. Okay, But the idea is that, in general, we ligate 20 amino acids to tRNAs. And so you can imagine that amino acids, therefore, become rate limiting in this reaction and in protein synthesis in general. So we have this big idea in nutrition that most certainly the best source of amino acids and, and really a broad um, conglomerate of all 20 of the amino acids comes from animal products. Um, certainly, if you look at any of the recent literature, they will tell you that definitely vegetables, fruits, things like that are really what they call the inferior sources of amino acids and other kinds of nutrients. Whereas if you were to eat the entirety of the animal, which includes the muscle, the fat, and of course the liver and things like that, you aren't, you aren't going to be deficient in anything. You're going to be getting your nutrients and you're going to be getting your amino acids. So... 
one of the key ideas with protein synthesis, it doesn't matter what protein you're making. It could be collagen, keratin, elastin. If you're looking at muscles, say you're trying to build muscles by going to the gym and working out, you could be dealing with actin, myosin, dystrophin, um, titan, things like that. The idea is you want to make it as easy as possible for your body to make the protein, so you need to get a superior source of amino acids because it is a rate-limiting nutrient, and you'd rather get a complete protein than an incomplete protein. So the idea is get as many amino acids as possible. If you get excess amino acids, they'll just get catabolized into the amino acid oxidation pathways. And we have videos on that as well. Okay, so those are the two rate limiting nutrients. You absolutely have to have those um, for protein synthesis because, as we'll find, each reaction of amino acyl tRNA synthetase uses one amino acid and one molecule of ATP. So these are absolutely required. Okay. The other thing that I want to at least mention is there are actually two types of amino acyl tRNA synthetases. By the way, one other thing that I'll mention at this point, these enzymes have another name. In general, they are called amino acid, amino acid tRNA ligases for reasons that we just mentioned. Synthetases are ligases. Okay? So there are two types of these enzymes. Okay? This video is going to be on the second type, and it may seem unusual that we're doing type 2 first. But the reason we do that is it has a more simplistic mechanism to it. So we're going to look at the organic mechanism of the type 2 synthetase. Okay, So when you look at the, the ligation of the tRNA to the amino acid, there's something really important to understand. Okay, If you go from, and obviously it's not in this structure because tRNAs adopt a very important tertiary structure, um, kind of like proteins do. But if you were to go all the way from the 5' prime to the 3' prime end, on the 3' prime end, it, it, it ends in an adenosine moiety. So the terminal, um, the terminal nitrogenous base, or we could say nucleotide, on the 3' prime end is an adenosine. And on the adenosine, what you essentially have is, is you're going to have the ribose ring. Okay? You'll have a ribose ring, and then the rest will on the 5' prime carbon will extend up to the 5' prime end. You'll have a 2' prime hydroxyl group and a 3' prime hydroxyl group. In general, for the tRNA to be functional, the amino acid has to be an ester bond to the 3' prime hydroxyl group. Okay. The type 1 tRNA synthetases initially attach the amino acid actually to the 2' prime hydroxyl group. But in general, that's not worth anything. Okay, The ribosome cannot deal with the amino acid ligated to the 2' prime hydroxyl group. So when you use the type 2 amino acyl tRNA synthetases, they will actually initially ligate the amino acid to the 3' prime hydroxyl group and you're done. You don't have to do any more work because that's how you want it. The ribosome can only deal with it when it's attached to the 3' prime hydroxyl group. However, if you use a type 1 synthetase, you initially attach the amino acid to the 2' prime hydroxyl group. And after that occurs, it's useless. So you have to do a little bit of work to esterify the amino acid onto the 3' prime hydroxyl group. Then, only then, will the ribosome be able to deal with it. Okay, That's going to be the topic of the next video because it's more complicated. In this video, we're going to look at the mechanism of the type 2 amino acyl tRNA synthetases, and we're going to look at the mechanism right now. Actually, before we look at the mechanism, I want to mention something that's actually really interesting. Um, this list right here, um, that you see over here on the left side of your screen. This list is an exhaustive list of all the 10 amino acids that type 2 tRNA synthetases react with. And I'll read them to you. It's alanine, asparagine, aspartate, glycine, histidine, lysine, phenylalanine, proline, serine, and threonine. Okay? Um, the other 10 amino acids react with the type 1 tRNA synthetases. One thing you might find interesting if you really think about it is Notice that 10 amino acids react with the type 2 synthetase and 10 amino acids react with the type 1 synthetase. I find it interesting that if you look at the distribution of amino acids and specificity between the two synthetases, it's completely symmetric. Okay, Just something to kind of ponder in your mind. 
But in any case, let's look at the mechanism. And actually what we're going to do is we're going to look at the mechanism if we were dealing with alanine, but understand that all 10 of these amino acids would react in the exact same way. So uh, if we look at the amino acid, keep in mind that we have an alpha carbon. And on the alpha carbon, if we look at this Fischer projection, of course we have a hydrogen, we have an amine. In the case of alanine, we have a methyl group, but in general that's the R group. And we also have a carboxyl group. And in the case of this mechanism, the carboxyl group is going to act as the nucleophile. So I'll do the mechanistic steps in green. So initially what's going to happen is, look at ATP right here. ATP has three phosphates, thus the name adenosine triphosphate. The first phosphate that is proximal to the ribose ring is termed the alpha phosphate. The one just after that is termed the beta phosphate. And the one most distal to the ribose ring is termed the gamma phosphate. So the carboxyl group of alanine in this case is going to do a nucleophilic attack on the alpha phosphate. Now, I could go into the um, exhaustive details on what would happen um, suffice it to say, what would happen is you'd get what's referred to as a pentavalent intermediate. This type of substitution reaction is pretty much identical to what you saw with nucleophilic acyl substitutions in organic chemistry. Uh, you're going to get nucleophilic attack, generation of this time, a trigonal bipyramidal intermediate, or what they call a pentavalent intermediate. So what would initially happen is this, these pi electrons between the phosphorus and the oxygen would kick up, okay? And then what would happen is they would kick back down, okay? So you could draw a separate pentavalent intermediate, but I'm just going to abbreviate it, essentially, okay? And essentially, whenever the oxygen-phosphorus double bond reforms, you're going to get loss of a leaving group. And this leaving group, in this case, is going to be something referred to as pyrophosphate. So all this business that I'm about to circle, this moiety right here, this is termed pyrophosphate, and it's shown down here. Now, pyrophosphate is a really important product of this reaction because, in general, what pyrophosphate does is it reacts with an enzyme called inorganic, because there's no carbon in this molecule, inorganic pyrophosphatase. Okay? Inorganic pyrophosphatase is a hydrolytic enzyme. Essentially, what it's going to do is it's going to split the bond between the two phosphate moieties in pyrophosphate. And so what you end up getting is two two phosphates, and so it'll look something like this. It'll be phosphate essentially at physiological pH. You get two of those, and actually what ends up happening is whenever you split that bond, you're getting an increase in entropy, and so overall what that leads to is a negative delta G. So the delta G of this reaction is actually far less than zero, and so you get a, a significant release of, of free energy that's used to drive work and drive this reaction forward. Okay. And whenever you, you do this nucleophilic attack of the alanine carboxyl group on the alpha phosphate of ATP and do the phosphoryl substitution, you end up with this molecule right here, which is called adenyl alanine. So notice something. Notice that the adenyl group right here, this is essentially adenosine monophosphate, but it's a group that's now in a phosphoester bond to the alanine. This is what we call activated alanine. So essentially what we've done is we've essentially created a good leaving group. Okay, so we're actually about to do another type of substitution reaction. Okay, now, like I said with type 2 amino acyl tRNA synthetases, what we're essentially going to do is directly transfer the amino acid moiety onto the 3' prime hydroxyl group of the tRNA. So that's what this is right here. This molecule right here, this is essentially what I'm denoting as the tRNA. I mentioned with the tRNA at the 3' prime end, there was an adenosine moiety, and certainly this nitrogenous base right here is adenine. Here's the ribose ring. And then the rest of this business up here extends toward the 5' prime end of the tRNA molecule, which of course has some tertiary structure to it. Now what's essentially going to happen is this phosphate that's part of the adenyl moiety is going to attack the proton on the 3' prime hydroxyl group of the tRNA, and that's going to induce nucleophilic attack of the 3' prime hydroxyl group on the carboxyl moiety of the adenyl alanine. Essentially, it's in a, a phosphoester right here, and that's going to generate something referred to as a tetrahedral intermediate. And obviously, for simplicity's sake, I've eliminated um, the intermediate, but suffice it to say, what would happen is you would attack this carbonyl carbon right here, generating a tetrahedral intermediate, 
And then what's going to happen is the tetrahedral intermediate will collapse back down and you'll end up losing the adenosine monophosphate as a, as a leaving group. So you get nucleophilic attack, generation of a tetrahedral intermediate, collapse of the carbonyl back down, and loss of a leaving group. So this molecule right here, this is referred to as the leaving group. It's called adenosine 5' prime monophosphate, or AMP. And it's essentially what you've successfully done at this point is you've now, you've ligated the amino acid as shown right here. In this case, it was alanine. You've ligated this amino acyl group onto the three prime hydroxyl group of the ribose ring of the tRNA three prime end adenosine. And notice what we have here. This is a really important and subtle point. The actual linkage between the tRNA three prime adenosine and the alanyl group is an ester okay esters they're less stable than amides meaning they're more reactive and it turns out that they're just reactive enough to where when this trna gets into the vicinity of the ribosome it's it's unstable and reactive enough for the ribosome to react with it and transfer the amino acid essentially onto uh, the growing polypeptide chain. And in another video, we'll definitely look at the mechanism of peptidyl transferase, which is the catalytic component of the ribosome. So hopefully this video gave you a little bit of intuition on the type 2 amino acyl tRNA synthetases. The type 1 tRNA synthetases, like I said, are a little bit more complicated, and they're going to involve, involve a transesterification reaction, which will be the topic of the next video. See you soon.